Abriana Stewart Height. I'm a third year PhD student in Dan Kodachek's research group. Today I'm going to be showing you Minotaur. In this demonstration, I will be presenting our four-legged robot, Minotaur, and I'm going to be showing not only the um, mechanical design of the robot, but I'll be demonstrating a couple of what we call gait behaviors. And so by gait, we just mean um, the generation of movement. And since this robot has four legs, we'll be showing the generation of movement for its legs. Today, I'm going to be showing you some gait behaviors. Gaits are also known as patterns of leg movements um, that we have developed for this four-legged robot. Interesting thing about the gaits that we develop, they're actually inspired by biology, specifically animal movement. Animals are known for being able to fluidly or naturally move in unstructured, complex environments. And if we want to make our robots be able to move in these same environments, then what better teachers um, for our robots than animals themselves? It's one thing for us to look at biology and try to mimic the movement, but it also helps us understand biology better when it comes to movement. So there are a lot of things in biology about the different ways you can move your limbs, the different gates that you can generate depending on the number of legs that you have. Sometimes we actually disprove our understanding of biology and sometimes we confirm our understanding of biology. And so what um, we do in our laboratory is that we work very closely with biologists at other universities um, because they're out there studying these movements, but they have no way to practically like redo the movements that they're learning about. What's novel about Minotaur is its specialized leg design. Each leg has two motors, also known as hip joints, which gives the robot um, a degree of freedom or an increased range of motion per leg. So each leg has two motors, which means there are about two degrees of freedom per leg. So there are eight degrees of freedom in total on this robot. And this allows for the robot to have increased range of motion, allows for the robot to be able to do more movements such as running, bounding, um, and even jumping and leaping. So what are the potential um, real world applications of this research? Well, one is search and rescue or disaster recovery missions. So typically when there is a disaster, um, we send people and sometimes we send dogs to go in and kind of find people, search for people, search for, for things to figure out causes of the issue if it's not immediately um, recognizable. And so these situations are very dangerous that we're putting these humans and these animals in. Well, if we're able to build robots that can do this for the humans and animals, then we take out um, that piece where people could possibly lose their lives. We make it safer, you know, reduce the risk of injury or, or death to humans and animals alike. Um, and also we can build these robots to be as big or as small as we want them to um, for the most part. And so um, some places where humans and animals can't go, we can send this robot. And also we don't have to worry about fatigue and and um, trying to, all the time it takes to train a dog to be able to sniff bombs and things like that. Um, so those are just two examples, immediate examples. One of the interesting things about this motor leg combination is that it's actually missing what's known as a gearbox or a box of gears, which just allows for rotation from movement to movement. And one of the good things about not having a gearbox is that it increases the performance of the robot in um, difficult terrain, it also allows for better control of the robot. Eliminating the gearbox allows for the robot to have a couple of advantages, one of them being um, maximum efficiency, which means that it performs really well in difficult terrain. Another thing is it allows us to have more control over the robot, being able to make it do more of what we want it to do. And one of the disadvantages, the robot has to operate in what's called a high torque, 
Um, and by torque, we just mean like force on the rotation and low speed, so very slow. And because it's operating in this sort of space, the motors get really hot really fast. So if we try to run this robot for 20 minutes at full speed, the motors will be almost burning to touch and they may even smoke a little bit. And so that's something we don't want. But when you're building a robot, you have to weigh the pros and cons. The sensing for the robot operates at high speeds and at high um, resolution so that the robot can actually see the ground, see the environment it's walking in with its motors and it can actually respond to changes in the ground, such as you know gravel or grass, such as if it steps on something in faster than the blink of an eye, uh, which is perfect because we want our robots to be able to react just as fast as we as humans or animals react when we're walking on different surfaces. was I said I really liked math and physics in high school. When I got to college, um, you have to take, a, the college I went to, you had to take a math placement test before you came. And based on your scores for the math placement test, that was the first math you took. Now in my major, I actually only needed one math, which I found out later on. And I wasn't happy about that. But in the beginning, I had took this placement test. And um, originally I got into business calculus. I went to business calculus for one day and I hated it. I thought it was way too um, remedial for me because um, I, I had already took calculus in high school and I was like, I already took this. So I retook the placement test and I got put into calculus for engineers and scientists. And I enjoyed the class very much and I was in a study group with other university students. We were all freshmen um, and we were talk, obviously working on math homeworks but then we get to talking about what people's majors were. And so we're going through and Everyone except for me was some type of engineering. And they asked me, they said, why are you taking this math class if this is your major? You don't need it. And I said, well, I like math. I enjoy this stuff. And I also told, you know, let them know. I was like, I don't even know what engineers are. Like, what do you guys do? Like, why do you want to be engineers? And I think that was the original moment that was like, hmm, maybe I should be an engineer. So I still consider myself a young researcher. I will say that I've only been doing research for probably four and a half years. My first research opportunity was my last year of college. Um, but I guess when I was in the beginning, beginning of the stages, I think the one thing I mentioned probably twice already is playing to my strengths. One thing I like to do is know what I bring to the table. I like to know what I'm good at so that when I come into a new internship or a new research group or even just a new like project group in class I like to know what I'm good at and so that when I come in I'm not coming in empty-handed I'm not completely lost I don't look completely lost I don't act completely lost I don't seem as though I know absolutely nothing and I'm coming here with a blank slate because you know you never really go in with nothing you have some experiences or skills that you gained in your life that you can bring to the table and so being able to know what those are or at least have a some type of like realization of something you were good at that could be used here um, I think is really good because intimidation is, is natural especially if uh, for me typically I come in and I'm the only woman I'm typically the youngest woman and then the only black person there um, so there are reasons to be intimidated um, and then coming from my background where I didn't do research until way late in life I didn't do engineering until way late in life um, you know so your background like it, you can be intimidated it's it's natural to have some type of fear but it, but don't let that fear take you out of your game you know you're here for a reason this is something you're passionate about this is something that you think you can can do based on the skills that you have. And so, yes, you're gonna have some weaknesses. Yes, there are gonna be things you don't know, but the only way for you to overcome that is to recognize your weaknesses, recognize your strengths, and then work on your weaknesses so that they become your strengths. 